America. Uh, I'm Mark Schmidt. I run the political reform program here, and uh, we're really thrilled to, I'm just going to welcome you all to this uh, wonderful discussion of the book Fragmented Democracy by Jamila Michener, who's a professor at Cornell. And uh, I think one reason we were interested in doing this event and doing it together with the Family-Centered Social Policy Program at, uh, at New America, which actually got this, got us started, was really because we're interested in the way we, we talk about political reform, but often conversations about political reform just go to voting rights or campaign finance or those things that we think are part of the, you know, the procedures of elections and legislative process. And I think we sometimes neglect the way in which, well, obviously the process of politics leads to policy, but policy and programs themselves have a profound effect on the way people feel they can be engaged as citizens, the kind of power they have, whether they're, how they're treated, um, and, and, and how they feel as they, as they participate in the other processes. And you, you don't get that linkage very often. So I think one of the wonderful things about this book is it's a lot about how particularly Medicaid has evolved, but a lot about how programs like Medicaid shape people's experiences of government and democracy and their levels of trust and confidence. So we're going to look at this from a bunch of different directions. and. Uh, Rachel Black from the Family Centered Social Policy Program will introduce the speakers, but we'll start with, uh, with her and Jamila. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. And thank you, Jamila, for being here. Thanks um, for having me. I don't think we would have expected when we started having the conversation about doing this event late last year that it would be so timely. Um, <laughs> Happy accident. <laughs> People always say, how did you know that this was the topic? That I had no idea. Yeah, it's quite prescient. Um, yeah. So I think you've been keeping up with the politics of Medicaid, right? Um, there are constant conversations about retrenchment, right, just connected to the overall um, yeah, landscape of ACA, then also the ever-widening net of programs that get encapsulated under the welfare banner. Yeah. Um, I think your book really helps us think about what the stakes are, right, for the, for the decisions that are getting made and the policy choices. But it also really complicates our understanding of what success looks like, right, because it's not just stopping retrenchment in this political moment. Um, so talk to us a little bit about um, how you see the stakes of what's happening now, but also how um, the solutions are much more deeply connected to um, really a very unstable foundation, and that's, uh, that, that's gonna be more work. Yeah, this is the, the, the theme of all my teaching, essentially. Students always say, I started off taking this class because I wanted to get solutions about poverty or about mass incarceration or about inequality. And at the end, I don't feel like I have any solutions. I just feel like the problems are deeper. Um, and essentially, that is what your question reflects. Um, and it's a theme in my life more generally, and in the, the book in particular, because you know, the focus of the book on Medicaid is really helping us to think about one aspect of Medicaid that's foundational because it's not just an aspect of Medicaid. It's an aspect of the sort of structure of our social policy in the US more broadly which is geographic heterogeneity, federalism, right? And the fact that across states, across localities, I mean, right down to neighborhoods, we see really different resources that people have access to. And that's the case in terms of Medicaid and a whole range of other things. Um, the, the problem, as I see it, because I'm a political scientist, so I care about political engagement and participation, um, is that I find evidence and I, I demonstrate in the book that, that this has implications for political engagement and, and participation. And so uh, the fact that people are getting such varied resources in different places correlates with the extent to which they're willing and able to engage in, in political participation. Now, if the question were just about resources, then we could say that the, the solution is, well, let's just give a whole bunch of resources. Well, there's two problems with that. Um, one is that that's not going to happen any time in the near future. Um, and, and, and depending on the way, we, the way we design healthcare more broadly and other systems, it may or may not be sustainable, although I'm a fan of giving more resources. Um, but the second problem is that the problem isn't just about the degree of resources, but it's about the distribution of them. And it's about the fact that the political mechanisms that determine the distribution of those resources are so closely tethered to 
geographic space and place. And so there are places where Medicaid is a lot more generous and where people are able to access a lot more services and have many more resources. And there are other places where it's the precise opposite. The, the, the way that I sort of change how we think about success in the book is to say that this metric, this metric of equality, has to be part of how we think about what success looks like for social welfare programs like Medicaid. And so is it success if people in New York State can get a lot and people in Mississippi or Alabama or Florida get dramatically less? I mean, I'm happy that people in New York State have access to more, but what does it say about our foundations and about our, our sort of nation as a whole that these disparities exist? And what, I, what we know from the book is, is what, not just what it says about our nation in a sort of you know, a broad idealistic sense, but what it does in practice is it creates uh, chasms as far as political equality. And that has sort of um, implications going forward, right? Because it contributes to this perverse cycle where we're disempowering the very people who might do something about this, right? So it means that we have to kind of take a critical eye to systems, to structures like federalism. Um, and that's more complicated, right? People always say, well, what are you saying? We need to get rid of federalism? Well, that's not tenable. Um, not exactly, and that's not exactly what I'm saying, although I, I would be lying if I, if I said that I'm not a fan of universal health care, because I am. Um, but the, it, it's really beyond like that, and it's about thinking through the repercussions of this structure and how we can work with what we have, or if it need be, transform what we have so that our reality comports with our ideals, which right now it just doesn't. I love how you bring up in the book that um, looking at the experience of the individuals, right, uh, and how they are experiencing the relationship between federalism and democracy. I mean, this is a metric that's been kind of outside of our calculus. Uh, and if we really want to understand how we are measuring up to those ideals, right, of equality, of democracy, that this is really kind of where you have to look. And so often, the people who are impacted by policy um, are outside of that conversation, and you deliberately bring that to the foreground of your analysis and your discussion in your book. Um, so bring some of those people into the room and help us understand um, kind of what your education was in kind of approaching the subject, how that changed, and um, how you want us, how you want your book to be a vehicle, vehicle for shaping how we understand the relationship between federalism and democracy. That's great. I, I love it when people ask me to talk about people, because I, I always find that much more interesting than most of the things that I talk about most of the time. Uh, I was thinking about having slides and just having the slides be like quotes from my interviews, right? Sort of bringing the people into the room. I was worried, though, that that would be so much more interesting than anything we were saying and that we would like lose the entire audience. So selfishly, I decided not to do that. Um, but you know, one of the things I always tell people is worth noting is that there, there are entire categories of, of challenges to our democracy and to our politics that we will not perceive if we don't insist on engaging and talking to people outside of the bubbles that we live within. So, I mean, I, I actually grew up, my parents are immigrants and I grew up in low income neighborhoods in New York City, so I haven't always been in a bubble. But at some point, I started going to graduate school and I started mostly being around people who were highly educated and who were from a limited number of backgrounds. And when I was in graduate school and I started to think about what I wanted to write my dissertation on, I knew I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a one trick pony, but I only have a few tricks. So there's just a couple things that I really care about and that I've always really cared about. And poverty and racial inequality and public policy are basically those things, right? And political engagement. And so I knew I want something in this realm. But in order to zero down on what that something was, I didn't want to go and like go to the literature and read a whole bunch of books and figure out, where is there a gap in the literature? I think I'll go there. That just wasn't a compelling mode of kind of identifying what mattered. And so, my dissertation advisors, although they were worried, allowed me to sort of have some freedom. And I, I started doing interviews, just talking to people, um, unemployed people on the south and west sides of Chicago. I was at the University of Chicago. It was convenient. Um, and there were plenty of poor people around, so it was also relevant. And I wanted to see what mattered to people in their lives. And I asked these ridiculously open-ended questions, like, 
And some of these my advisors suggested, so you know, it's on them. Um, one was, what do you think about the American dream, right? Things like that, like, well, what do you think the biggest, what are the biggest ways that like government and policy affect your life? And people started bringing up healthcare a lot. And I didn't bring it up because it was literally not on my mind. Uh, and, and I realized if the point of the exercise was for me to identify an area that mattered for people, I identified one. And so one of the early uh, people that I interviewed, I call her Mabel in the book, everybody has pseudonyms. And Mabel, you know, I asked her this question, what do you think about the American dream? And she said, what American dream? is a nightmare. And she went on to tell me about having to choose between paying for her diabetes medication and paying for her food. And I said, well, what about Medicaid? And she said, well, I was on Medicaid for a little while, but it was so demeaning and it was so, you know, just unbearable that I stopped. Like, I, I never recertified, I never re-enrolled. And I was like, that's crazy. You have diabetes, you need medication. How, like, how demeaning could it be that you're, you're risking your life? And, and she went on to tell me, and she had this interesting story, but it was all about place. She had moved at some point to the suburbs outside of Chicago. And you know, it was during a time when her, fan, her son was doing well economically, and he moved to the suburbs and sort of brought her out there with, her, with him. And that was when she first uh, was unemployed, and she, so her first experience with Medi Medicaid was in the suburbs of Chicago, like Naperville or something like that. And it was nice. It was a pleasant, positive experience. She's like, I didn't even know I was going into a Medicaid office. It was just in a bank building, right? And everyone was nice, and I got immediate service, and it was great. But then her son lost his job, and they had to move back to the city. And she went into the Medicaid office the first time she had to re-enroll. She's waiting on a line that's around the corner, on a block that's really uh, dangerous. She's looking at the litter on the ground. She's looking at the, the building crumbling. She goes in there. The service is bad. And after enough of that, she just decided, I don't even know if this is worth having this health care. And that was the first inclination to me that, like, A, this matters to people, and B, it's really about place in ways I hadn't imagined. And the more people I talked to, the more I was told that, right? Um, one of the first people I interviewed when I moved to Michigan and I started a postdoc at the University of Michigan was a man who I call him John in the book. And I was really curious to, to hear from, like, honestly, I'll be completely straightforward, from some white people. Because when I was in Chicago, I was mostly interviewing um, black and Latino folks. And it had actually been difficult for me to recruit white people because a lot of the recruiting I was doing at first was face to face and like the white people just said no, they just didn't want to talk to me about that topic. I, I, I don't like sort of presume to know motives. I think it was just, they, they, I, it didn't seem like a conversation they were interested in having. So when I got to Michigan, I recruited in some different ways so that people didn't see me initially and I got some interviews. So I'm, I'm interviewing this guy named John and he seems like a kind of middle class white guy and it turns out he had a kind of chronic debilitating disease uh, that prevented him from being able to work. He had had it since he was a child, had been on Medicaid since he was a child, and had all of these experiences. But at some, and he told me a ton, I mean, it was like a two hour conversation. But at some point, he told me about wanting to move to Arizona because his family was moving to Arizona. The weather was better, for, his doctor said, you'll do better there. The weather's actually good for your, his, his condition involves some issues with his lungs, um, and the cold air was a problem, and there were all these reasons he wanted to move to Arizona. And he started doing research about Arizona's Medicaid program, which, if it's instructive, is called the Arizona Healthcare Cost Containment System. Um, Medicaid is not even in the title. I couldn't make that up, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't be as interesting if I made it up. Uh, and as he did his research, he was able to talk to people he knew in Arizona, because there are these kind of communities of people in different states who, who have this chronic illness. And he was able to talk to people in Arizona who have that illness. And they were like, no way you shouldn't come here. Like, you won't be able to get, you know, they, they told him all of the different services and benefits he wouldn't be able to get. He said, some of these things, like, my life is going to be in danger if I don't get them. I can't move there. And so he watched some of his family move to Arizona, and people were able to move on with their lives, and they weren't. And he just said to me, I don't understand why we can't have one program. And I just had conversation after conversation with Medicaid beneficiaries without me prompting. Because remember, at the beginning, I didn't know this was what I was doing. I didn't know I was going to write a book that was about federalism and Medicaid. Uh, and it wasn't until I went back and I started listening through all these conversations and realized people keep invoking place, either on the state level or on the local level. That is a huge part of this story. So 
to say that like, well, bringing people's voices in is important. It, I wouldn't even have realized that this was something that mattered as deeply as it did unless I was talking to people. That's just not something I was going to pluck out of my head. Although I was fully aware that Medicaid was an intergovernmental program and it was heterogeneous across states. But that translating into a concrete understanding of what that meant for people's experiences, for their lives, for their political engagement, that only happened by being willing to engage those people. Yeah, and I think something else that really comes through is just how clarifying it is, right? I, yeah. Things like, um, why isn't there just one program? Yeah, why isn't there just one program? I was like, uh, you know? <laughs> I could tell you Good a point. long story about US history of US social policy and health policy, but I can't really answer that right now. Yeah. But uh, that being the general takeaway from one's analysis of one's own experience, right? I remember talking to a mom in Jackson, Mississippi about her experience navigating TANF and SNAP, and she said, I don't know why they make it such a hassle. If people need help, why don't you just give it to them? It's like, why don't you just give it to them? I mean, exactly, right? Um, in ways that when we're approaching it from a more policy or politics kind of orientation, right? I think it kind of, um, there's some white noise that happens, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and we, is, we kind of trip scary. over, <laughs> kind of trip over our, our own analysis. I'm glad that you um, mentioned um, the kind of Orwellian name of Arizona's Medicaid plan um, because I wanted to share a quote, if I can, um, from Terry that I think um, kind of it is a really kind of incisive observation about how these programs work. Um, Terry, and this is a woman who has experienced Medicaid in multiple states, some positive experiences, some negative, um, and this is you know her observation about that. And if it was up, it, excuse me, if it was about helping people, you would say yes. Let my state be more productive and healthy so that we do not have to have people losing their lives and so that they can be productive citizens. And I think w what really grabs my attention about that statement is like, its conditionality, right? If it was about helping people, um, it is not a foregone conclusion that these programs that are set up with the ostensible goals of supporting people's access to quality health or to food or to cash um, are designed in ways which allow them to execute that goal. And um, it is perceived by people who are navigating these systems that that is, in fact, the Hey, so their well-being is being held in tension with some other priority, right? Yeah. And that priority is winning out. So if it's not about helping people, what is it about? Yeah, this is interesting. So last week I was in, or maybe it was, it was the week before that, I was in Tampa at this event that like a health care collaborative had invited me to and they were like we really want to get a sense of like our consumers right Medicaid beneficiaries because they think they, they sort of call them consumers in this language of consumers um, and we want to know how to sort of get them more engaged and what we can do or what we might be doing wrong so I'm talking to this room I mean there were probably 250 people in the room of, of providers practitioners some policy folks and um, one of the things that really stood out in that conversation was, so I gave a talk, I talked about the book, and afterwards, someone came up to me who worked for a healthcare provider and said, you know these things are not happening by accident, right? <laughs> you know that like, the fact that experiences with Medicaid are causing people to be disengaged from government and causing people to like, utilize the program less and utilize the benefits less, like, you know that's on purpose, right? He's like, and I know this from the, from a perspective of like the provider end of things. There are people who, who we want to stop coming to the office. And you know, I don't know how politicians think, but I would imagine there are people who they don't want going to the polls. And he's like, what do you have to say about this, not, this being the way the programs are designed to work, right? And I thought, nothing really, because that's deeply, profoundly depressing. Um, but of, but of course, right, there's, there's some, and I think there's, there's probably heterogeneity in that too, right? I think there are places and there are people who very much want these programs to serve the purposes that we imagine for them, uh, to provide people with more security, with, uh, with more well-being, to take care of folks 
Uh, and then there are those that don't, and, and so those goals are intention. And the, the part that you just brought up that was crucial for me was realizing that that tension is apparent to the beneficiaries. It's easy for us to imagine, like, one of the questions I would ask people in my interviews was, well, how do you imagine a Medicaid, the average Medicaid beneficiary in your mind? And I was always astonished that people like usually said something negative, even though these were Medicaid beneficiaries that I was talking to. But they imagined that the average beneficiary was someone not like them, someone who was like just trying to live off the government or on the dole or not working hard enough or what have you. And they weren't like that. And they went to lengths to explain why, but they imagined this other thing. And I think that you know, whoever it is that we imagine that we're helping, there, there's a variation in that. There's variation in the extent to which we, we think that a program like Medicaid is the way to do it, and the extent to which we're willing to sacrifice resources in order to do it. I, I was on this radio show earlier today, actually. It was like called in, and it's, I don't know what the thing is. My producer said, this person from, a, or my publisher said, this person from a radio show wants to talk to you. And he kept asking me questions about, like, what about the taxpayer? You know, well, what about the fact that this is really expensive for the taxpayer? And should the taxpayer want to put their money into this program? And there are all sorts of arguments about, like, why actually in the mid and long term this is perfectly sensible from the perspective of the taxpayer. And so I went into that. But I kept thinking, I wish you could talk to some Medicaid beneficiaries. I wish you could understand people's experiences and you could understand the way that navigating this institution shapes their lives. And they're taxpayers in different ways. Um, and even if they're not, there are fellow citizens, and that might sound cheesy, but, but it's also true. Um, and they matter. And I just wish we could shift the conversation in a way that centered the extent to which these are people, they're human beings who have dignity, who matter, and it doesn't have to be this way. But it is, and it is by design. And I try to emphasize that in the book. This isn't happening accidentally. I don't know the extent to which people have nefarious motives in their head. And I try to sort of assume the best. And I also don't necessarily care about what's in people's hearts and minds. What I care about is what policy is purveying. And what policy is purveying as far as Medicaid is, is, is a particular kind of inequality that's rooted in the very you know, political institutions that we've built in this country over a long time but that has really concrete meaning for people. I always say to people, you know, I know when you hear the word federalism, your eyes glaze over, right? But stay with me, because this one actually matters for real people. Well, I think you, you, you talked about, um, you know, public support kind of being framed around an image of you know, who they presume, right, the beneficiary to be, and the challenge of reframing against that presumption. And I think that's made even more challenging when that presumption is actually codified into the policy yeah. choices. And we're yeah. seeing um, these choices being adopted more and more, even within Medicaid, which has historically been understood to be um, a health care program and not a traditional welfare program, but uh, is trending towards um, adopting things like work requirements, things that you see <laughs> Um, in TANF, something that's usually a, a, a distinction of being a more um, traditional welfare program, um, which inherently communicates that you know, people will not work unless coerced, right? And that they are, um, that they're lazy and trying to take advantage of the taxpayer, right? And this also comes across in other things like drug tests, which yeah. communicate that you are a criminal, that you are definitely trying to fleece a program, um, or any number of other kinds of, um, of any other policies that are not rooted in any kind of evidence that they are necessary, um, that people who access these programs are categorically different than anybody else, but they are very effective at branding those beneficiaries, right, and creating stigma. Um, and so many of those are just rooted in a presumption of um, a beneficiary's race. You know, the identity is just so deeply connected to those design choices. And I think the recent um, experience of Michigan, right, um, Everyone knows I've been ranting about this for a while. <laughs> you just had a new piece uh, published today in Polyarchy. I encourage all of you to go that check it out. That began as a rant. The, uh, just how it all begins. 
and the passion comes through. So talk us, talk us through that because race was decisive, right? And how they were choosing to, how they were proposing to implement the adoption of work requirements in the state. And there are other states, so, so Michigan has, uh, has pulled back on this and there are other states that are still, that still have a similar plan, right? Like Ohio and, so essentially Michigan said, okay, we're gonna have work requirements. Um, one of the things I talk about in the piece is work requirements in and of themselves have racial implications, right? Uh, people of color are more likely to have criminal records. They're more likely to be discriminated against in the low wage employment market. Uh, they're more likely to live in areas where they have challenges with transportation that get them to work. W work is harder. There's, there are higher barriers to work for African Americans and Latinos. That is just impossible to argue with, I would say, from the vantage point of the social scientific record. And so when we say then that work is going to be a condition for a program, we have to acknowledge that that has racially disparate effects, even if there are no other design elements to that policy that, that implicate race, right? So I actually think work requirements in and of themselves are racialized, right? But Michigan went a step further and said, okay, but we're gonna have exemptions for people who live in counties that have high unemployment rates, not people who live in cities that have high unemployment rates. And the high unemployment counties are the rural counties where lots of white folks live. And the high unemployment cities are Detroit, Flint, places where lots of black people live, right? Now, the reasoning of, according to the sponsors of the bill is, well, if you're in the same county, you can, you can get to the job, right? Well, yeah, not if the transportation infrastructure is bad, not if you're being discriminated against because there are other people in the county who those jobs can be given to who, are, who don't happen to be black. So that, you know, on its face, the kind of, this doesn't have anything to do with race. This is about the fact that it's actually easier for you to, I mean, I don't, again, I don't know what is in anybody's heart and mind, and I don't presume to know, nor do I want to, but both sort of in terms of impact um, and in terms of sort of the obvious design, a policy like that is gonna have racially disproportionate effects. I mean, the piece I made in, in the sort of, in the polyarchy, or the point I made in the polyarchy piece is that we should not be surprised by that. So the fact that Michigan gets flack for this and then walks it back, right? But the sponsor of the bill says, but we didn't walk it back because of race. Because race didn't have anything to do with it in the first place. We walked it back because administratively this would be a nightmare. Well, you, know, you, you probably walked it back because you got a lot of flack that was based on race. But the fact that he could claim that like saying race had anything to do with this is ridiculous. And I think that, that was the actual quote, ridiculous. You can only claim that if you assume sort of gross negligence of the nature of American health care and health policy, right? If you pretend like if from the very beginning, what, from whatever point we started to have anything that looked like health policy in this country, it has been racialized and designed at first explicitly, and maybe arguably now less explicitly, although that's arguably, in ways that were going to disproportionately affect racial minorities. If you pretend that that history and contemporary the reality is not, doesn't exist, then you could say race, race doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, but if you know about that, how one can sort of in, in truth say that, that their, their racial implications aren't clear, I don't know. And, and that connects to a lot of um, different aspects of social policy, Medicaid and other policies, where they're sort of deeply rooted in ideas we have about who's gonna benefit and who, who's deserving, who's not. And embedded in those ideas are, are racist and classist perspectives that so long as we can sort of distance ourselves from them and, 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 and say that that's not our motivation, uh, we don't really have to reckon with the, the, the scale and extent of change that has to be made in order to achieve anything that even approximates equity. Uh, so I wrote the piece, yeah, it started as a rant because I just thought, how could, you, how could you do this and act like it doesn't have anything to do with race? Um, but you know, it, it has to be much more than a rant for us to see the, the degree of, of policy change that we're gonna need. And oftentimes, race is sort of siloed. Like, we're now more comfortable talking about race in terms of cash assistance because people have been doing it for so long and there are books like Why Americans Hate Welfare and the answer is like, because of race. Um, and we've and we've been thinking about those things for long enough that we're like, oh, okay, race and like welfare, you know, technical welfare, cash assistance, well, those things are connected. Well, it's it's much harder to acknowledge that that is the case in in nearly every, not I would say in every right area of social policy that we cannot silo race, but we have to confront it across the board, and that feels a little overwhelming. 
I mean, my students, you know, I, I taught a public policy class this semester, and when we started talking about race and public policy, I had a student who came to office hours and said, this is overwhelming. If it's in everything, how are we going to fix it? And, and, and maybe, maybe it's just because you see race everywhere, because there's something about you. And that's a much more comforting thought, right? You people are just so paranoid, are victim mongering. Um, much more comfortable to think that than to think we need to imagine profound change in order to get to a place of equity. I, I admit I'm intimidated by that. So something else that's siloing race from the conversation does is make it seem that it's just about bias, right? It's about individual it's relationships. Individual yeah, yeah, absolutely. And kind of ignores um, the structural mechanisms that we have for I mean, effectively weaponizing that bias, right? For codifying that bias into policy. And I think something that you lay out very clearly is the way that federalism has functioned in that way, right? I think that you're very measured in your assessment of um, it's not a, a wholesale indictment of federalism. Uh, you describe in ways that kind of remind me of like chicken. I mean, it just kind of absorbs the flavor of whatever <laughs> you're cooking with. And we just- I am gonna use that in the future. <laughs> um, feel free. Um, and it just so happens, like the flavor that we're cooking with is racism. Um, and have been for like ever. And have been for ever. Uh, and it is, you cannot look at the history of anti-poverty policy, right, being implemented through a federalist structure um, without seeing federalism act as a mechanism of racial exclusion and social control, right? Um, you see that you have these punitive and paternalistic policies um, show up basically wherever black people are, you know, um, in the South right after what was the precursor to, to TANF was started. Um, work requirements and benefits were aligned with the harvest season, right? Um, you don't see work requirements in TANF in northern states until the Great Migration when black mothers start moving north. And that's still, I mean, visible today. States like Oregon, who have almost an entirely white population, yeah. um, have much more generous benefits and less restrictions on access than places like Mississippi, for example. Um, so I think looking at where there's continuity, right? What the interstitial tissue is. It isn't as though these patterns are independently generating in silos. You know, yeah. there's something, there's some kind of mechanism um, that's connecting them together and enabling, right, um, the absorption of racism into the chicken apparatus. So my question for you, knowing what we do about how federalism functions in this way, um, wouldn't it make sense for us to have something that we're less susceptible to absorbing those flavors and um, better was better aligned for actually executing the policy goals that we set forth? Yeah, so there are two ways I think about this question. Like, one is the part of me that wants to say something that seems pragmatic and realistic and attainable. And this is when you said, well, your approach to federalism in the book is measured. This is because enough people who read it and said, well, the, the takeaway from the book can't be that federalism sucks, right? I mean, nobody, well, it's not going anywhere, and that's not really very helpful. And so I tried to think about, well, what are, the, what are some of the other takeaways? But, you know, so there's the kind of pragmatic, assuming the system is, is going to be around for a while, how can we think about how we might make it better, maybe on the margins, maybe a little bit further in than the margins? Um, and then there's the like real me in my heart of hearts, because I don't care about what is in other people's heart and minds, but I know what is in mine. Um, and that's the part of me that wants to think in a much more transformative way. And so people will say to me like, well, you're wasting all your time thinking about Medicaid when really we just need to be focused on like Medicare for all, right? On universal health care. Then we won't even have any of these problems. Absolutely. Grant that, grant that to you. I am there with you, right? Because the geographic heterogeneity, all of the challenges built in to Medicaid as it is presently structured and many other social welfare policies, I think 
improve substantially if we shift to something that is centralized and federal. At the same time, I don't think that kind of move gets us out of the pickle unless there are a lot of other things that change with it. Because right now, states are a useful, states and localities are useful, convenient, and they have long been mechanism for transmitting racial bias through institutional means, right? For weaponizing, federalism is a useful mechanism for weaponizing racial inequality in the way that you so aptly put. Now, the question I would have, which is a counterfactual that we just can't know, is if we change things, if, if federalism was structured differently, if programs were more centralized, would we just find a different mechanism for, racial, for weaponizing racial inequality? Because if there's one thing that US history has shown is that we're really good at finding really creative ways of perpetuating racial inequality, even when we think we've got it, we think we know it when we see it, we think we know how to avoid it, and it pops back up again. And so, you know, I get into these conversations um, with, with colleagues and with students, and they're like, well, where does this leave us, right? Everybody has to change in a deep internal way, and racism has to not, no longer be a part of our political culture before we see anything be different. I, I don't like saying that either, because I like thinking about things in terms of institutions and policies, and I don't want progress to be reliant on people or, or even institutions no longer being racist, right? Um, so I want to think about institutional mechanisms, and I'm happy to see dramatic transformations to federalism. I think it would be a great place to start. Or even thinking about how to equalize resources across states and building in policy mechanisms that do a, a better job of that, right? Um, but at the same time, I'm sort of painfully aware of the possibility that even under that kind of scenario that I imagine to be like more rather than less transformative, we'll have some difficult reckoning to continue to do, which is not, I, don't, I know that's not a, a good answer as far as what we might want to hear and think. Um, but I think it's the truth from my vantage point. So when you're talking about, um, you know, kind of chicken or egging, right? The yeah. culture versus policy change, um, there's a, great line um, Ibram Kendi uses in Stand From the Beginning, oh, that's a great the definitive history of racial ideas in America, um, where, he, and this is going to be paraphrased, something like, you know, uh, racial hate doesn't, hasn't driven the history of um, racist ideas in America. Racist policy has driven the history ah, of racist ah, ideas in America, yeah. um, which I think goes back to what you were saying, right, uh, about the role of institutions and how they, um, how they are resistant to or deeply embedded with um, the kind of bias that we're trying to um, trying to root out. So heads up to the rest of the panel, one more question that you guys are coming up. Um, so I want, want to end, Finally. I'm going to end with a quote from you. Oh, I'm no. going to quote you to you. Um, this research exposes troubling political inequalities undergirded by a federated political system that too frequently mutes the voices of economically and racially marginal populations. It is no small thing then that in order to produce the findings, those very voices had to be heard. In that sense, the methodological foundations of this work gesture towards the shift that must occur in American politics if we are to strengthen and preserve the democratic process. So, my final question for you before opening the conversation up is, what do you think the capacity of federalism is to, um, to adopt that methodology that uh, invites, engages, is responsive to and reflects the voices of people who are mar marginalized under our current approach to policy making? Yeah, so if, given federalism, right, assuming it's there and assuming that it largely looks the way that it looks now and that sort of social policies are taking the form that they're taking now, uh, the, the hard question for me, and a question that literally a reporter asked me earlier today, is like, well, so then what are the mechanisms? Like, what, what are the mechanisms for, for something actually being different? And assuming we don't get universal health care, assuming the basic contours of, of what we have now don't change. Um, and one of the things I said, which I think always uh, is dissatisfying to people, but, but is what, what I will say, because it's what I think I can say confidently, is that when I think about mechanisms for change, 
I don't necessarily think about specific policy mechanisms. Like if we, I mean, there are policies I like more than others for sure. But um, I don't often think like if we do this one thing or these two things or these five things solves the problem, right? Instead, I tend to think in terms of process mechanisms, right? So what sorts of elements can we introduce into the political process that will perhaps help us to get to different policy outcomes that change the feedback cycles, right? Um, and I probably think that way because I'm a political scientist, so there's some bias there. But connecting to the quote that you read, the, the process mechanism that I'm kind of like most obsessed with is thinking about creative ways of, it, of incorporating the voices of Medicaid beneficiaries into policy processes. It's hard for most people to even, oh, what does that even mean, right? It's even hard, it, it was hard for me early in this project to really understand what that meant too. But over the last year or so, I've had the benefit of going all around the country and getting to like meet with and talk to different nonprofit organizations that for whatever reason, I did not imagine that this would necessarily be the case, but it was such a pleasant surprise, are interested in the work that I'm doing. And they're always interested in the work from a very concrete vantage point. Like they don't want to talk about the literature, they don't want to hear all about like the intellectual foundations of my work, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's quite refreshing, um, although it puts me in, in sort of uncharted terrain because they, what they want to know is how can we think about what we can do differently. And so a few weeks ago, I was talking to some folks in California and they said, well, in 1999, you know, the uh, Policy Institute had this big survey of like over 2,000 Medicaid beneficiaries and we got all this information about what their experiences were and what their perspectives were. And, if we had more information like that, we could do something about it. We could figure out where there were openings for change. We could imagine policy in a way that connects to what people are actually experiencing. And that's, if there's a place that I see, like within the bounds of federalism, there's room for action, uh, it's, or for something maybe hopeful, is that all across different states, there are these different actors that are like, how can we bring in the voices of Medicaid beneficiaries? And, you know, I've been talking to community groups that are literally like, we know what we're going to do. We're going to like add an intervention that we weren't doing before focused on helping to engage healthcare consumers civically and politically. We're going to actually try to create the kind of political foundations necessary for change instead of just fighting one-off policy battles. No, 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 not this waiver. No, 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 not that waiver. No, 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 we need to expand. One-off policy battles that we're sort of under-equipped to fight because not enough actual people whose lives are deeply dependent on these policies are involved, right? So instead of doing that, we think about processes for bringing these folks in on a basis of equitability, not in a way that's about tokenism, and on a basis that allows what they teach us to actually change our direction. Like the Medicaid beneficiaries that I talked to actually changed the direction of this book and made it what it is. And do we have, even as like, activists or policy folks or policy wonks or advocates or what have, have you, do we have processes such that the people that we imagine we're acting on behalf of have an opportunity to shape the direction that we go in? And a lot of the organizations that I interviewed for the book, I would ask them something akin to that and they'd like kind of guiltily say, not really. There's, yeah, we're all about Medicaid advocacy. We don't really talk that much to Medicaid beneficiaries. We don't really know what they think or what they want or what they experience. Not all of the organizations, but enough of them that I thought, okay, there's a process thing we could do here from a micro sort of organizational level to a more meso state level, and probably not now, but under a different administration, perhaps on a national level, what are the processes for actually incorporating in a substantive way the voices of the people who are most affected by these policies? If there's a direction that I would want to sort of advocate for, it would probably be that. And as you said, I mean, that's a methodology, not just for use within policymaking, yeah. it's also valuable within the context of our own work. We yeah. shouldn't be imagining people we're working on behalf of, we should be engaging them. Yeah. Um, thank you for giving us such a strong model for doing that in your thank work. You. And I'm gonna invite the rest of our panel to come on up. Yay! I always tell students, it's, it's only interesting hearing me talk for but so long. And you all, we've already passed that mark. So it's really nice for other people to join. So I'm gonna start with Perry. 
So thank you all so much for joining the conversation. Um, it's really an amazing group of folks who really come at this issue from a bunch of different angles. Um, Perry Bacon Jr. is with um, 538, he's also a previous uh, New America National Fellow. And Perry, you have been following ACA for a while, both as a journalist, kind of looking at it on the ground, but also um, as a political observer, right? You're seeing it from both vantage points. And I'm really curious to hear kind of um, your reaction to um, Jamila's comments and in the context of that perspective that you bring to this. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, you know, my job is to cover day-to-day -day politics often. So, I mean, my first thought was, we didn't use the words Democrat or Republican very much, probably intentionally up here, but in the reality, yes. the whole Medicaid discussion is entirely about Democrat and Republican. And if you look at the states that have expanded, it's also like, you know, if you think about partisanship and race, if you look at the states, I think there are 34 states that have expanded Medicaid, 16 that haven't, the 16 that haven't are, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, Missouri, you know, exactly, it's not just Republican, but Republican states with lots of African Americans in them. So I mean, so I think that's the way to, so that's kind of where I, you know, the place matters so much in part because we've sort of race and um, party are so tightly tied right now. I mean, you know, I'm from Kentucky, I spent a lot of time sort of following the news there. And the one thing you said about the idea that if Medicaid beneficiaries were more involved, I guess I feel like I watched that last year. Medicaid beneficiaries were involved in sort of fighting the ACA repeal. And in Kentucky, I think there have been some polls, like 80% of the people oppose the work requirements. I'm not sure. It's not clear to me that's going to make any difference. You know, I think, I think the, so that, my first thought was it's obvious to everyone, I'm sure, in the room. But the party factor here is so important to the place factor. Yeah, and this is a great point to bring in Lena Sharma. She's with Community Catalyst. And you work directly with organizing um, people who are impacted by the policies that we're talking about in advocacy yeah. efforts around those. I'm really curious. I mean, Jamila has talked about the um, yeah, it, it, kind of the erosion, right, of trust in government to do good things and act mm -hmm. on your behalf. Um, so how does that show up, right, in your mm -hmm. efforts to engage those people in changing the policies that are marginalizing? Yeah, and I mean, as Jamila was talking, I couldn't like nod my head enough, like, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. These are like things that come up when we talk to um, our advocacy organizations that we work with on the ground to engage Medicaid beneficiaries and to really kind of connect them to political life. And we saw that, you know, firsthand last year in the ACA fights um, with our advocacy community all across the country really kind of um, coming out and showing their, uh, you know, why, AC, the, why Medicaid matters to them and what it means to them. and why it's important for their voices to be heard. And that's sort of what Community Catalyst, <clears throat> Community Catalyst and the program that I work for, the Center for Consumer Engagement in Health Innovation, really um, fight to do is make sure that the voice is at the center of every policy, you know, healthcare policy decision that's being made, because it's their voice that should help guide policy change, policy behavior, policy, you know, effectuating the type of policy we want to see in this country. So. Um, and I, I had a video that I'm happy, I'd love to show if this is the appropriate time or... Yeah, go for it. Okay. My name is Cassandra Adams. Just about everyone calls me Cassie. Five years ago, I found myself at the bottom of all bottoms for me. The cable went, the electricity went, and eventually the apartment went. So I found myself homeless in the street. Where do I go? No, nobody can make it out here alone. I really do enjoy expressing my story because I've been told by others that just in telling my story helps so many other people. I'm an advocate for uh, people that once was homeless or are still homeless. We go to Harrisburg and we go in them senators' offices and as a group, we do make an impact. So um, advocacy, we, is a voice, a voice for the people. And I wanted to show this slide because it 
So, and I've seen this video a number of times now. We just recently uh, released it, and um, all everybody in our staff was emotional when we saw this. It's a part of a larger story about um, connecting health and housing, um, and particularly for Medicaid beneficiaries. And I think her voice, <clears throat> what empowered her was knowing that there was a community of people out there who wanted to advocate on her behalf and that wanted her voice to be heard on that, on that behalf too. So she was involved last year in the fights in Pennsylvania to protect Medicaid. She was involved right now, you know, work requirements, arguments that are going on in Pennsylvania right now. And so, you know, this illustrates a lot of what Community Catalyst does, what the Center for Consumer Engagement does, and how we do it. Um, you know, one of my slides up there was about um, showing a system of advocacy that we like to talk about with our, um, with our advocates. You know, what's the opportunity and then what are the different capacities that we need to, um, we need to provide for, for uh, our advocacy organizations to really get to that policy win? And one of the biggest ones is grassroots organizing. You know, if we don't have the voice of the people um, as part of the conversation, then you know, kind of like what you said, we're not really getting at um, what's going to be impactful for, for Medicaid beneficiaries in the long run. Um, and it, that sort of intersects with so many different things that in our organization, we come across, you know, from race to class to gender to ageism. Um, and all of those things sort of are, you know, encapsulated in one to make sure that we think about how we, how we engage um, not just beneficiaries, but then how we engage the advocacy community um, and how we build coalitions and how we sort of, we become the power um, so that we can take it to Capitol Hill or, all, you know, the state capitol, wherever those fights are happening. Great, and this is a good place, Avi, for you to jump in, Avi Green, with the Scholars uh, Strategy Network, and you and Jamila uh, and a couple of other colleagues um, wrote a paper not too long ago um, that provides a framework for understanding civic engagement. And something that was, uh, I think, so revelatory in Jamila's work is um, the way that she lays out through the experience of Medicaid beneficiaries um, how things that we see as just kind of um, bureaucratic interactions are actually um, political transactions, right? They give us a sense of our own political value, how responsive government is going to be to our actions. And I think in the framework um, that you guys developed, um, you look both at an assets and a deficits uh, the assessment of, of, of these factors that I think are kind of outside of what we typically think about as, you know, levers of, of democracy. So could you talk us through what some of those are? Sure. And, and I just want to start by saying I'm just so glad that you're throwing this. It's such a, a pleasure. Um, one of the things I really like about working with, with Jamila, with Professor Michener, is that you, uh, you haven't given up on dreaming big, even if you're grappling with these problems, which your, which your research and lived experience shows are so enormous. Uh, and, and so when, when I think about civic wealth, the idea that we, we threw out, um, and I think about Medicaid, I, I think about three, three definitions of the word treatment, right? It comes, comes up a lot in your book, right? So first there's the medical treatment that we're hoping that people get. But right through federalism, some people are getting better treatment and some people are getting worse treatment. And then I also think about what, when most people think about civic engagement, especially about raising civic engagement, raising turnout, cost per vote, that sort of thing. There's a whole, um, there's a whole industry right now, a philanthropic and political industry that's associated with the idea of politics as experimental treatments. What happens if I knock on your door? To what percentage do I raise the likelihood that you're going to vote, right? But Medicaid is also a, a political treatment. It's an experiment, it, and it can be measured as an experimental treatment, basically. And, and that's what Jamila's work does, right, is look at it in that, in that frame. And then lastly, right, when we often think about treatment, or when we often use the word, right, there's the question of how do we wish to be treated as human beings, right? And one of the when we talk about place, right, we, we use it as a shorthand. Uh, but what, what place is in American government is it is an overlay of local culture plus local and state government policy. That, those things come together to form states. That's, I mean, there's other things, but that's the main stuff, right? 
And what is happening is that sometimes Medicaid in some states is treating people more like people. And in other states, it's treating them more inhumanely. And one of the things that we have to grapple with as a society is that these treatments really last. Because they're not being applied to just one person or to a random selection of people, but they're being uh, treated to whole populations, like the black population of Mississippi. And therefore, there are intergenerational effects that matter. I mean, it's, it's wrong in and of itself. I, I, you know, I, as, a, as the non-political scientist sitting here, I just want to bring up that it is ethically wrong and just call that out. Uh, I'm, I'm allowed, right? And then secondly, right, it is also even worse because it's th these effects are pernicious and last over time, right? So the next, I think, challenge that I hope uh, political scientists will, will think about is how do, you, uh, how do you use what we know about experimentation, right, and about these, these treatments, right, uh, to think about how can we structure the equivalence of races to the top that, uh, that take federalism into account, but that shift some of the incentives for some of these states. And I, and I think actually Medicaid expansion is actually a positive example here, because despite it all, it's spread to 34 so far, and it's only been going for a few years. And if you look at Social Security, which also had a discriminatory design at the beginning, it did eventually expand and move to universalism. So can we figure out ways that we'll take some of that same knowledge and apply it so that Medicaid can start to treat more and more people like human beings and therefore lead to these positive political civic engagement feedbacks? And then we'll have a, a nation that has more civic wealth. And I think to do that, and we have to change the government operations, right? right? Because what we've been talking about is uh, organizing, advocating, mobilizing to fill in the carve outs, right? So how do we switch the default so the policies that we're creating aren't generating inequality um, as soon as they pass, right? And I think, Reggie, this is where you and your work come in. Um, this is the million dollar question. So Bridgie Gordon, who's the director of Richmond, Virginia's Office of Community Wealth Building. Um, this is some of the work that you're trying to undertake, right? You're trying to establish an office within, uh, within city government that is explicitly charged with reducing poverty and engaging um, a lot of the people that, we, uh, that we've been talking about right now. Um, I think Jamila's work shows how, um, you know, through the lens of Medicaid, how people-based policies still play out in place, right? And that uh, since there's disproportionate exposure to policies and institutions that act in a marginalizing way, that um, the African-American citizens in Richmond, Virginia, um, are getting the message that, you know, your citizenship holds less currency, right, than other's people, than other people's is reinforced over and over and over again. So talk to us a little bit about your work, not only kind of establishing um, the office and how it's functioning, but also how it's in, in engaging um, with a community of people who have been receiving that message over generations. Thank you, Adam. Glad to be in the company of people who are thinking this way and trying to move these issues forward. In Richmond, unfortunately, we have a 25, 26% poverty rate. We're a medium-sized city, 220,000 people. And our office started to put into effect a strategy for wealth building. And we have moved away from saying, even using the word poverty, because that in and of itself, we realized, sort of set apart this, this class of we are going to help the poor people in Richmond. Now, as the director of the Office of Community Wealth Building, I found it really uncomfortable walking into a room filled with community members and saying, I'm from the government, I'm here to help, and you're the poor people. <laughs> you know? So we, we try, have, we've been intentional about having listening sessions where we invite people in, or we go to the neighborhood, literally on the street corners, and say, here's, what's, here's the plan. How does that resonate with you? We represent not only government, but myriad nonprofits and agencies who think they're doing the right thing. And so we're like this conduit back and forth to the community. And what we have learned, and it rings true with what you said earlier, the response is 
uh, anecdotally, no, no one's ever helped us before. No one's ever listened. Meanwhile, we have hundreds of nonprofits, hundreds of agencies, and the mm -hmm. millions of dollars for decades. And if the response on a street corner or in a listing session is, no one's listened before, we realize there's this disconnect. It's because we have been using the research and sort of walking in, and, and here's the program for you, as opposed to beginning with, OK, tell us about your life. And if you were to construct a, a program to move from where you are now to economic well-being or financial stability, what would that be? And we're getting some responses which are um, illuminating but also challenging because the system currently sort of places a greater value on those of us who have the degrees and <laughs> have worked in policy that, that we're the ones that should be able to, to create, create a, um, the mechanisms to help people. And we're trying to flip that. Uh, we have ambassadors that we've trained. These are people who've come through our workforce program. And we actually took them through similar discussions that we might have. We talked about Maslow's hierarchy of need. We had someone to talk about truth and racial healing. And even the Maslow discussion was not what we expected, because we assumed the response would be, I want to get those basic needs met first. But there was a lot of discussion about self-esteem. The most important thing is having a sense of self. You know, the, the food, the, you know, the shelter, yeah. But if you're not respected in the community, how can you move forward? So I think as we continue those type, type of honest and authentic conversations, will make headway. We have network group meetings that have a mixture of the community and the providers and ministries working on the policies that need to shift. Uh, and I'm excited about what, we, what we're learning together. And, and the response has been, finally, you know, you're listening. In Richmond, Virginia, you're listening. Uh, and we have um, high hopes that we can help people in other cities use the same framework. We are saying to Richmond, it's time to move from a charity framework to an economic well-being um, framework. So that's not the people who need to change, but it's us. That, that's our main impetus at this point. And let me follow up on that. Um, so for you to be responsive to that requires you to be set up in a way um, that's flexible, right? For right. you to be iterative. Um, and actually kind of embed what you're hearing from the community yes. in your operations. That requires you to function differently yes. um, than government traditionally does. And I'm really curious about how you've been able to carve out the space to be able to do that and what the challenges of being embedded within city government and trying to model a new approach to governance has been. I, I think people uh, are listening to the words that we're using. Although we're in city government, we have a mayor that's very supportive, a city council that's supportive. And we talk about compassion and, and what is the role of your government. These are citizens in Richmond who are looking to move forward. And for far too long, we have expected to find them in this neighborhood that's low wealth or that school that is underperforming. And how do we begin to say, no, we're all, we all have assets. And having a mayor that believes in one Richmond is a, is, is, um, sort of resonates not only through my office, but that message is being clearly uh, relayed to the people at large, you know, just people in the community. Can I, so uh, I wanna, that, that's first of all, that's amazing. I love just getting to hear about what you're up to. Um, and second of all, I wanna point out like a little bit of what may be a tension, but I think is more just an instructive point of difference between the sorts of things that, um, that Avi and, and Lena and Reggie are saying, and, and even me to a certain extent, and the kind of insight that Perry brought to bear, which is like, how come we're not saying anything about Democrats and Republicans? Like, there's this whole big thing that's structuring all of our politics, and somehow it hasn't come up. And I think that that tension is, is really instructive, right? Um, because what, what you just said toward the end there, Reggie, which is actually we have a mayor that's supportive, and we have a, right? So there are other layers of, of political institutions mm -hmm. that actually allow us to go there, right. that actually allow us to do this, right? And so, Without the, those layers, right? Had you had a, a mayor that was like, actually, no, we need to get these people working and to stop blah blah blah, it would be it would be difficult to even start to think about. Let's have listening sessions, right? right? Mm -hmm. So I just want to underscore, like, even though I feel like there's some distance between, so I don't I don't think about the world in terms of Democrat and Republican in part because I mean, in practice, in many ways I do, um, but in in um, 
sort of in, in, in theory or even when I'm imagining what I want the world to look like, I don't. And some of that is just training, like as a, as a professor up in front of the classroom, once you start talking about Democrats and Republicans, there's half of the students in the room who now hate you and have unplugged, right? So you must learn how to think about how to reframe things, but also because that it, it just makes everything so much harder and messier. And part of the reason is because partisanship imposes some real constraints on whether we can do these things that we're talking about doing and or how we have to or should do them. So I've been really struck by some of the, um, I, I spoke at Communi Community Catalyst's Southern Health Partners meeting, in, um, and it's all the Southern health policy advocates. And they're dealing with a completely different context, right? They're like, actually, we're in a hostile, relatively partisan context, and we have to do things completely differently, even in terms of the, the kind of advocacy end of it. They're like, when we go out into the community and we're trying to get people on board with Medicaid expansion, we have to be able to go to rural communities, talk to people who are, who, who are Republicans as far as they understand themselves, but who are actually be, being hurt by the lack of expansion and try to get them on board. And then we have to go to Republican legislators who represent those constituencies and try to get them to understand that like, you might want to think about this even though it's completely against your partisan interest. And that does introduce a layer of difficulty and challenges, but it, it doesn't introduce the kind of challenges that mean that this stuff about like people's voices and Medicaid participation and engagement doesn't matter. It means two things. A, that that matters even more, but we need to be savvy in thinking about how it matters and how to channel those voices so that they can break through the partisan barriers. Um, and B, that it's not all that matters, right? So I'm, I'm very much about political voice and engagement, but that's not all that matters because the engagement unfolds in a context where there are political institutions and structures like parties that are tremendously important. So I wanted to at least say that and try to sort of connect some of the, the, the disconnect between sort of the way that we seem to be talking and the very pragmatic, like, let, let's get real mm -hmm. perspective that you brought that is so crucial too. So Jamila just teed it up for all of you guys. So <laughs> anybody just feel free to step up at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I love, um, you know, there's a slide if we could pop it up. Because well, what you just said, it, uh, it's after this one. It sort of is what we continuously sort of talk about with partners that we work with on the ground, right? Like, it's not just, it's not just about organizing uh, consumers, but it's about figuring out all the different, com all the different capacities that on the ground advocates should have in order to get to that policy change, in order to be able to, um, you know, get the leadership and then, you know, get to that. So it's the policy analysis and understanding stakeholder dynamics and, you know, within that state, within that county, within that locality. It's understanding, you know, who are, uh, how do you communicate that, the messaging. And that's something, you know, we're constantly evolving in how we message. Um, how we message to different audiences. So what we say to our advocacy community versus what we say to the media versus what we say to policymakers, um, whether it's on, you know, whether it's a D or an R, what we say to them, how we say to them, it really matters. And then fundamentally, what, what's that on here and what conversations that we are starting and having for the past number of years, and I know we've had this in the call that you spoke at, was, well, how does this now, where does race fall into how we do all of this, gender, Right, um, you know, sexual identity. How does that fall into all of this? Um, when we think about class, education. So, each of these single capacities, and then thinking about it from all those different lenses, impacts how we convey our message. Um, so it just goes to that point that you made. Yeah. Let me add. Um, this is a good. This is a good map. And yet, it's affected, of course and structured by larger laws and systems that make things difficult, and they make things difficult deliberately. So for example, most community health centers, right, have, many of them have embraced a voter empowerment model where they register voters when they come, uh, and that sort of thing, and it's a wonderful thing to do. But oftentimes tied with state or federal uh, contracts that they get to operate, are silencing clauses where they can't actually talk in detail about the health policy issues which are facing those those which pose to those community health organizations questions of survival, right? Um, 
And they certainly can't, because almost all of them are 501c3 organizations, say to the recipients, um, well, you know, you want to know what's going on with Medicaid expansion? If you vote for candidate A, they're in favor. If you vote for candidate B, they're opposed. And that might be the single most important piece of information you could possibly give, right, when it comes to the uh, political empowerment or civic empowerment of a Medicaid recipient, right? And yet you may be pro prohibited by law from telling them. Um, and uh, th these challenges propagate themselves through the system, coming down through um, foundations, which are often, which are bound by their own set of regulations, and they prefer to give to 501c3 organizations. Um, Low-income uh, community organizations want to get money, so of course they go to foundations since just like going to banks, you go where the money is. And then, of course, in order to get that money, oftentimes they are asked, please set yourself up as a 501c3. And a self-silencing uh, uh, phenomenon ensues. And I, I spent years on the other side of this doing nonpartisan voter engagement. Um, and it was super difficult, right? And I think that it's, it's actually incredibly to the credit of Community Catalyst and their partners around the country that they have thought about careful ways to push this envelope that constrains their speech, right, um, to, to its edges, to speak as rationally as they are allowed to and as compellingly as they are allowed to. But interestingly, at the other ends of wealth, right, um, when confronted with a challenge on the ability of wealthy people to use their political speech, um, they just chose to change things. You know, Citizens United, for example, is all about wealthy people realizing that they could have more political speech in a certain way and going to get it. Um, and I think that we need to think about how the very rules themselves are constraining in perhaps unfair ways. So do we do that by just making it more visible? Is that enough? I, I think, I mean, a question I constantly have is, is it a lack of information or is it a purposeful understanding um, constructed in a way that kind of suits your own needs, right? Um, just, I mean, really can I just answer that. I promise people in most states know which parties are Medicaid and which what isn't. I think, don't you? I, this is from my reading of polls and talking to people. That's not a mystery. There are some people who don't, don't support those policies for certain reasons, but they're not, they're not really confused about I, I did a few bunch of Medicaid expansion stories and I went to states and people sort of knew who to blame was for, you know, who, who, the, who decided the policy. I would agree, but I would also say that the act of political communication is more than just about information. Sometimes it's about repetition to, to add someone into a community. And I would, would actually say that that's what's so impressive about what's going on in, in Richmond. It reminds me of, you know, George W. Bush talked about having, creating an ownership society. And I would say that like, that's what you're actually doing. That's what I thought when you were talking to. You know, by thought, starting yeah. from the idea that people are owners. And a lot of our politics doesn't allow that. And can I just add to, so Medicaid expansion is like the big you know, pink elephant in the room. And so it may be the case that like knowledge, or it's certainly the case that like knowledge of the average person or the average low income person around Medicaid expansion is much more than it is around like a lot of the other like mundane health policy and other policy issues that matter really, really deeply for people's lives that they just never really connect to a, a particular party or a particular political official or to politics at all, right? So I would say beyond them knowing whether to map it Democrat is rep and Republican is the function of like flagging for people that this is political in the first place, that maybe their participation or engagement could potentially even change it. And so some of the work that these organizations might be doing if their political voice wasn't constrained in that way is to either bring attention to these less salient things, right? So things like if our state gets Medicaid managed care, what is that going to mean for what happens with my disabled child, right? right? And I talked to beneficiaries who, I'm a stalwart Republican, but once I realized, once somebody told me, this means that maybe my kid won't be able to get what they need to live. I switched it right up. And making that direct link for people and doing it in a way that's consistent, I think can potentially get us past some of these policy bar barriers, especially when it's not salient. The salient stuff, just like my students, they just shut down. Like, oh, we're talking about ACA. I know exactly what I think. Shut down, stop thinking, stop learning. But when you're in areas where people are less familiar, that's where you really have room to make some headway and to get them to connect in a different way. And ultimately perhaps to behave politically in a different way. 
And so Medicaid expansion is important, but it's probably the hardest case for this stuff. And there are many more cases that are, are that may be more fruitful for thinking through how these processes look on the ground. And one of the things I would add to that um, is the importance of, of training consumers and consumers, patients, beneficiaries um, about about the, these different programs, about the programs that they are on. Um, there's a story I was torn between sharing Cassie's story or Seanette's story. And Seanette is a, Seanette is a woman who, um, who participated in a training that we did called Lift Up Your Voice. And what she says in her, in her video that we took is that I didn't know I had a voice before I was trained and understood what was going on. You know, she's about to enter into a, pro, a managed care program and she had no idea she had a voice. And so I think it's important to sort of get out there into the communities, which is what you know, our partners on the ground do, and to train people to say, you have a voice. You should be empowered in what you're doing. Um, and that also speaks to sort of like the concept of transformational uh, organizing, Transfer, you know, having uh, the ability to go out to the community and train uh, consumers on not just a particular policy area, but that they stick with that organization through the long term, through the different fights, the policy fights that come out from. And so, you know, those are the couple of things that, you know, we strive towards, that it's not just that we have consumers for this one fight, but how can we then ensure that, you know, their voices are heard throughout the different um, policy issues and fights that, that are going to come about in the future. Um, and a lot of our organizations that we work with do that. You know, they have a base of people uh, Medicaid beneficiaries, Medicare beneficiaries, or people who are on both Medicare and Medicaid, um, they have a base of people that they're able to then mobilize, empower, and engage when these fights come about. So going back to this being, you know, training, the training piece and sort of making, you know, having people understand that their voice matters um, can go a long way in making systems change. I was in a meeting with the commu a community group a month ago and this, that very topic came up and we just let the conversation flow and it landed on this idea that they want to create, we have a citizens advisory board, of using the, 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 the people as the experts rather than us hosting a meeting or trying to educate on Medicaid expansion or child support came up quite a bit. Right. Let them be the expert presenters yeah. and have it in, in the community and we're on the periphery, which I thought was a brilliant way to make it accessible. Mm -hmm. Because often, you know, we're, you know, people are being talked to by those of us who have studied it, you know, but, but then again, I mean, if you, you, you're more relatable if you've lived the experience, you know how to navigate all of these systems and processes, and that gives you instant credibility. So. It also gives that feeling of, um, like, what I have to say is matters yep. mm -hmm. versus the power dynamics in a yep. room when, like, well, I have you know, such and such degree exactly. and such and just experience. So what I have to say matters more, yep. which and is not always necessarily yeah. true. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Good. We're on the same page. <laughs> so let's go ahead and open it up for questions. There's a microphone somewhere. Christian has it. So just wait till it gets to you and raise your hand and he'll bring it on over. And there's a reception app after, and you have to speak <laughs> now to be able to have access you to that. You can't eat any food at the um, reception. No food. Uh, you don't. I really appreciate everybody's perspective, and I just wonder, I mean, the old saying about, you know, children and poor people don't vote, and that's why their interests aren't better represented. And I just wondered, I mean, in this day of voter suppression, but what do, you, what do various people think about how to register voters and get them more involved? I mean, you mentioned voter suppression, so that's an easy place to start, which yeah. is to stop making it more challenging for people. Um, but I do think, I, I mean, I think there's like straightforward answers to that, and then there are like the more, uh, the kind of deeper answers. And so there are many people, I will say this, who, who are not, who are alienated from the political system and not even interested in voting. And so no matter how easy you make registration, uh, they may not engage, and, and it's in, in part for the, some of the reasons we've been talking about, which is that, that they don't perceive the system as being there to serve them. I actually had a conversation with my brother just before the most recent election, and he said, I'm not voting. And I was like, oh gosh, you're hurting my heart. 
I'm a political scientist. How could, why did you even tell me? I mean, you could have just kept it to yourself, right? I mean, the logical thing to do, just you keep that button up and pretend with me. No, he said I'm not voting. And, and he just started telling me about like friends of ours from high school and how many of them had died and uh, the neighbor up the street who you know was having a hard time and who like literally couldn't afford food and they were trying to figure out how to get that to them. And all of these like really concrete issues in day-to-day -day life, someone a few blocks away who had been shot in the head recently, he even said, you know, I get pulled over by the cops like two times a week. What am I voting for? What, like, what, what, what system am I interested in upholding? So I think there are some really d deep sort of aspects of institutional inequality that voting is almost, it's, it's weird even talking about voting it, when I go and give, give talks or, or try to engage with different communities. It feels so far away from everything that really matters. And until we address some of those things that really matter, it's hard to motivate people to vote. At the same time, unless people vote, it's hard to address. So it is this really difficult challenge. I think there are, you know, there are things we can do, certainly, but it, you know, it's, it's not to be overstated that there's, a, I think there's an upper bound for, for many of those things without more um, fundamental change that touches people's lives in a real way. And you make the case in the book, right, that, um, that we learn lessons about our political value through a range of interactions with government, whether it be the police, whether it be how you're treated by your caseworker, um, and that there are you know, other ways for us to engage that are kind of more proximate to yeah. what's valuable for us and the way that a lot of these systems are functioning now. Um, create some kind of form of like invisible disenfranchisement, right? Mm -hmm. And it's something that we're not paying attention to um, because it's, it's under the radar and it's administered through state systems, right? It is at the hands of the police, which, I mean, we know that, and yet, um, you know, after incidents of uh, police brutality in black communities, um, the rates of calling 911 goes down, right? I mean, this is supposed to be a service that's there for the community, and uh, the people who are most vulnerable are, are, are opting out, and this also happens within uh, public assistance, right? I mean... Uh, did you want to go for it? Sorry. No, go for it. Yeah. This, yeah, this, um, the part... Your book talked about federal and the state level, but I think the thing I've been thinking more about is like the city level you get out of the sort of left-right thing quickly. Like if you know, Nicolana Jones is, writes about school segregation a lot, and one thing she says is, if I could get people in urban areas who all voted for Hillary, essentially, to actually believe in school integration, that'd be the biggest star. Forget about, yeah, uh -huh. you know, forget about all, you know, Nebraska. Let's what about, why is, why is New York City the most segregated schools? That's what I was thinking is, your book really made me think about the way in a lot of urban cities, there's a way in which we communicate where it's clear these are the bad schools, these are the good schools. And we do that over and over again. And even people who I think are, like, I'm constantly in conversation about with people telling me, I'm moving to Maryland for this reason. And the subtext I'm listening to is, oh, your school has more than 30%. You know, like it's coded usually, but I know what the words are for that. And so I'm getting there at some point. And that's what I was thinking is how do we, so those things can be changed through, through interaction like, there's a way to communicate in the city level too to where this is not bad and this is not, black does not mean bad, needs to be addressed, you know, I'm using a racial context here specifically, but I think in general, even the city level, we also do these things where we discriminate based on Absolutely. race and place. Absolutely, so there's one chapter in the book where I focus on cities and yes, how this really. plays out in cities and I look at Chicago and variation across neighborhoods in Chicago and how that maps on to these kind of dynamics in terms of the linkage between policy and politics. And the, the kind of the, the, the takeaway from that is that where urban inequalities are most sharp, that's where we really see this policy politics nexus being the strongest, right? And, but when people are living in places that are flourishing, that aren't disorderly, that are doing well, their interactions with policy, even if those interactions are negative, don't affect them as much. They're not as vulnerable to being alienated by the government when they're living in broader conditions that are actually sending them signals about their value. But when you're living in, a, in, a, in, in like local conditions that are sending you signals that you're not very valuable, and then you have these disempowering interactions with government, it's just those things further reinforce each other. So, I mean, thinking about the local aspect of this, to me, is a little bit more hopeful in the sense that 
you know, it's, it's like you said, Reggie, like our mayor is on board. I mean, there, there are spaces there where we can find actors that are willing to operate. And there are perhaps, there's a base of voters that are right now maybe doing things that don't really align with their values. And maybe we can work to raise awareness and change, right? So there, I, I think that if there's a place where I feel like there, there's more room for some of these changes and bringing people in to the electorate and into the political community more broadly, it's, it's probably in localities. Even though there, there are all sorts of challenges, but it's just not as hard and as daunting. And maybe we, should, we can hold some things constant. Like, OK, partisan context. Mostly everybody's Demo Democrats. We got that constant. Now let's work on the other stuff. And it just kind of makes it a little bit more um, palatable, I think. Can I add, add a, a thought about uh, cities? One of the challenges that faces cities is that in most of the cities uh, in the United States, the electorate is a lot more white than the people who live there. Um, and so there's an issue where the voting that you just mentioned came in. And there's actually a very specific and pretty easy thing that you can do, uh, which is change the date of the election. So the election for mayor in Chicago, I think it happens in May or April, right? The election for mayor in New York happens in the odd year. Right? And so those elections, when they're high turnout, might crest 40%, if you're super lucky. But often they're at 30 or low, and therefore skewing far away from the kinds of folks who are often recipients of, of Medicaid, right? and skewing far away from the demographics of those cities. They're pretty exclusive. It's a whole different thing on presidential election day in those same exact cities when you have turnout of 60, 65%, um, double often or triple what a municipal election would be, much more representative. Um, and the effect, by the way, of changing that in terms of turnout makes the effect of something like election day registration, which is the best single reform we've seen in the lit literature, it, it, it can be a, 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 an effect size that's five, six, seven times higher. Um, and we don't have to wonder about whether or not something like that could work, because as usual, uh, California's already done it. So, um, <laughs> California recognized that this was a problem in LA. They're in the process of shifting mayor elections in uh, LA, LA to the on year. They'll be shifted in a couple years. They, and they gave all the politicians a free extra year uh, to, to go. Um, and then they passed a law that said in localities across uh, California, if they have turnout that is too low, and I would read too disproportional, but the law just says too low, um, for two cycles in a row, then they're just forced to move to the on year. And I think that's the kind of thing which would allow urban policies um, to be even more uh, at the front lines, uh, which, which ideally is where, where, they, where they should be, the, the front lines of you know, promoting really good uh, egalitarian policy. It's a basic acknowledgment, I mean, that government bears some responsibility at maintaining the infrastructure of democracy, making sure that there are points of access for its citizens to influence it, right? Which is supposed to be allegedly its function. Um, that doesn't like shift the onus onto the individuals trying to get out votes, trying to get people to show up, educate them about issues, just make it the default, right? That this is a system that works for them. You maximize participation. So question, Mark? I, I'll be quick. I'm interested, there's a kind of a viewpoint that hasn't really been reflected on the panel, although I think you kind of alluded to it at the beginning, Jamila, which is, and I don't, I don't actually endorse this, but it's, it's the idea that, you know, you're just going to make programs like totally universal, everybody gets the same stuff, the way Social Security is, that's the only way you get away from this nasty racial politics. And of course, the problem with that is you, you have a, you know, some, there are needs in some places that are not needs in other places. But I, I just wonder, I just want to kind of like nudge that viewpoint onto the table and see how you, how, what responses you have about that. Oh, that's great. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I, maybe this is just a consequence of sort of being an academic or just my personality, which is that I overthink and I'm sort of naturally cynical towards anything that's proposed as a panacea, right? Um, so it's very often the case that when I talk to people about the book, they're like, well, you did all this research just to basically have us conclude that we need to make this thing universal. Like, duh. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I, again, I'm not opposed to, a, a, when it comes to healthcare, I actually think, uh, it, I would say this is the case for, for more than healthcare. 
But I think we can make a strong case for healthcare, given the cost of healthcare, the complexity of healthcare, the tremendous burden that healthcare can put on state and local budgets. There are all sorts of reasons why we, we, should make, we can make a strong case that, if anything, should be centralized and universal, that it should be healthcare, right? And so that's like the low bar, we can't even agree on that, then the other stuff we can't even start thinking about. Um, and so I, I'm happy to make that, I, I, that's, that's where I, I stand, but I also don't think that that is ultimately going to completely get us around some of the different inequalities that emerge, in part because the place-based inequalities will still be there. And another facet of the argument that I make in the book is that like, even when you're getting a policy that looks like it's the, it should be the same thing across place, you know, if we think about within state variation, why is there within state variation in terms of how people are experiencing and um, benefiting from and responding to Medicaid? State, what the states are offering are generally the same, but the places are different. And so you don't get around that by like making the program universal, which means even beyond saying, let's have one universal program, we have to keep thinking about how to deal with the kind of place-based heterogeneity of a, of, a, of a country like the US. And a universal kind of centralized program gets us somewhere, right? It gets us a lot of uh, far, I think. But it doesn't get us around some of the deeper dilemmas. I don't know if that was responsive. I would, and I, agree, I would agree with you. And sort of just this is just Lena saying, like in an ideal world, yeah, universal health care would be, yeah, would be great, right? But you know, you're right. I mean, there's so many other factors in in our real world, in our current world, um, where politics play a role. And you know, not to get too technical, but when you think about different types of health systems um, who have a say in the market. Um, that, that's that's going to be a that's a big elephant to fight against, um, I think. Um, so it, you know, there's just so many different stakeholders who um, you have to think about when we think about um, you know a broader universal healthcare system and who has a say and who has financial incentives um, to to say you know to be in the conversation in one way or another. Um, so that's sort of adding <laughs> an added layer to like you won't take away some of those racial inequalities. Um, class, gender inequalities that come into play, um, but then you also have to think, you know, those stakeholders that um, that uh, that are going to want, you know, want some financial say in, in it as well. So, another layer of complexity. Elizabeth, uh, just <coughs> jumping back slightly to the previous conversation about what can be done local. So, first, of course, the election thing is like the healthcare is deliberate. The, the reason states have odd year elections is to suppress <laughs> turnout. But specifically thinking about Richmond, and of course Virginia has not yet right. expanded Medicaid. Maybe this week, we'll say. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can talk a little about you know, what you can and can't do given that policy context. And sort of, you know, I think we all struggle with what you can move locally and then what you, know, you really just mean them to take the expansion. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, this sort of ties into the previous question. We have struggled uh, as a system of uh, not only with the government, but local government, nonprofits, about changing our uh, approach from a programmatic to person-centric. And so, yes, we have thousands of people in our community who are in need from a healthcare perspective, income perspective, mobility, transportation. And I think where we have tripped up in our mega system, which is we calculate like a $350 million system for economic mobility with around 191 organizations. We're trying to get more granular on exactly who is in this space of moving people out of poverty. I just, I just use poverty, but I usually don't. <laughs> so I, this is going to be harder, but everyone's story is so different. Yes, there are some people who are trapped because of a medical issue or, um, in fact, here's a, a story that we heard recently. Someone walked in to apply um, for a work program that we had and she put on the application that her last job, she used a pole. And so when my workforce team uh, interviewed her, they said, what do you mean, man, she's like 35 years old, what do you mean pole? She went, I'm a stripper. And uh, <laughs> she said, and my mother has cancer, and my children have some disabilities, and they're in school, and 
I am caught because I can't keep doing this much longer. But, you know, but the, the, the health care issue was, was, was she, she realized that she, her life would have to shift because her body would not be able to maintain the livelihood that, you know, the way she's been making money. So we said, well, ma'am, we'll, we will help you. And of course, the question was are there, uh, about drug use. And she said, yeah, I smoke weed every day in order to self-medicate to do this work that I do. And so we said, well, we'll take you in the program, but once we find a job for you, you probably will have to be drug screened and you can't continue to, to smoke weed. She did not show up the next day. So I know that there are thousands of people. Who, this is those a medical issue. You know, she was being, doing, being a really responsible daughter and mother because of the, the weight and burden of the healthcare system. So those are the kinds of stories we hope to relay through local government, even to state, to, to personalize what has sort of turned into like healthcare, Medicaid expansion. Here's, this is, these are the people. And I think that's gonna be our role when we talk to the community and gather those kinds of stories. Perry, you look like you want to jump in. I guess I'm left being the person saying, there was an intentional effort to make sure there were no hearings about the bill because the stories would change the policy so we won't have hearings. So I mean, so it's, because um, I was thinking about, you know, more political participation. Like you could imagine someone, if someone started some kind of like organized all the Medicaid recipients and state X, Medicaid state or non-Medicaid state. I can imagine the Medicaid program itself would be more responsive to consumers if there was some Medicaid recipients group that the providers talked to, the state talked to. I think that would be true. I don't think those people would have very much political power because despite, your, your students apparently are better, are better people than I am because I think when four <laughs> black people walk in the room in real life, everyone assumes they're Democrats and so stops listening anyway. So I mean, in terms of, you know, in a sort of Obamacare way, I'm not sure that, that you're, the idea your students are like not listening to DNR until you bring it, introduce it, I don't see. So I'm not sure that the, in other words, I'm not sure that political organizing in terms of like low income groups is gonna make much difference in terms of political outcomes. You think I'm wrong about that? I don't know or that low you're wrong. power groups. I think, let's see. I think it's complicated, right? So first of all, the thing to realize is that it, it, there are plenty of places where the lion's share of Medicaid beneficiaries would be like poor white people, right? Yes. And so who identify as Republicans? Yes. And who, if they started to push their legislators in more, right, might actually send a signal to them like now you have to do something. So that's an, that's that's a, a possibility that's worth acknowledging, even even within the sort of constraints of partisan structures as they are now, there's ways that um, Medicaid beneficiaries could exert power, right? But the other thing to say is that like absolutely organizing, mobilizing in and of itself, right? Just like, okay, in a vacuum, we get all the Medicaid beneficiaries to do something that's gonna be effective. No, because we're not in a vacuum, we're in a political context. Where th this is the case for any group, right? That just getting them out there, just mobilizing isn't enough that that needs to be done in a ways that are strategic, in ways that, are, that acknowledge sort of political constraints and limitations. Absolutely, right? Um, that being said, I think that even in, and this is just based on research I did with grassroots organizations during the course of writing the book all over the country, even in the states that are most hostile, even among the people who, uh, Medicaid beneficiaries, I'm shutting down because I know, I know what I'm about and this isn't it, right? Even those legislators, um, when put in a, in a context and maybe not, so for the big ticket things like Medicaid expansion, where like there's a lot of party discipline being exerted, you're going to vote on, we are all gonna vote the same way on this. You know, maybe that's where the ability of beneficiaries or constituents is gonna be limited and there's work to be, do, to, to be done as far as the organization of the party system to change that. But there are plenty of really vital mundane issues that, you know, you actually can be swayed one way or the other on, depending on who's in your office, who's in your face, who's holding you accountable, who. So I think there are spaces where these voices can matter. And those spaces might not seem like a big deal to us because it's not the big like, we're gonna expand our universal health care, but it's absolutely a big deal for ordinary people who rely on, like, wait, what's gonna happen with home health care? If home health care goes away, I have to be institutionalized, or my parent have to. Those are decisions, Pennsylvania wanted to mess around with home health care. 
And a lot of the organizations that were, mo that were mobilizing, Medicaid beneficiaries and other low-income people, got them to push, to exert pressure, and they walked it back. And things like that happen all the time, even in red or relatively hostile places. And more of it could happen if more Medicaid beneficiaries were, were involved, and it could matter. That I doesn't get us out of everything. The other thing, the part that I was going to say was, when I was meeting people who were trying to enroll in Obamacare, it was clear that the people who wrote Obamacare, some of whom work, you know, who I know quite well, had not spent a lot of time talking to yeah. beneficiaries about, here's this computer program which you will sign up for health insurance. We, we, we said it's going to take 50 minutes and require, in reality, you have to, all these forms and so on. Yeah. Mo, that's what I was getting at. It was like your book really helped me remember why to. Everybody I met, the people had a really hard time enrolling in healthcare despite, yeah. you know, Barack Obama saying how easy it was all the time. It was not like buying an airline ticket. And also, <laughs> everyone actually doesn't have a computer in the first place. It was a really bad, ticket. you know, it was a really bad image even. But, yeah. So I, yeah. Was, I agree with you. But, yeah. but this would, is so important because it, it, it just shows yeah. that there are some real complexities here. There are yeah. no sort of easy, if we just get more people involved, there's a bunch of conditional on other things that need to happen as well. And I would, I mean, it's not. It's not easy organizing uh, people oh, on no. the ground. It's, it's really challenging, and it takes you know, years of work to build a base. And you're right, it's not the only thing that sort of gets you to that policy change. You, know, you have to bring other stakeholders um, to the table. So when we have our advocates on the ground, even in, you know, in Virginia, um, talking about Medicaid expansion, you, know, you have advocates, consumers at the table, but who are your other allies? Who are those provider allies? Who are the hospitals who are going to benefit from Medicaid expansion? And sort of thinking about that, so when you go to a room full of legislators and they, they're going to see each stakeholder that has a say in this, that sort of changes the tone of the conversation. And speaking of Pennsylvania, recently, you know, our advocates connected with a different sector. So it was the health sector and the housing sector connected because those are so interconnected in how um, our health outcomes are impacted. And they had a coalition of people went into a legislator's office. The legislator said, uh-oh, you found each other. <laughs> right? So it, it's just sort of you know, bringing those right people to the table in addition to organizing and getting those voices out there for people who are going to be ultimately impacted by expansion or any other change. So let me connect what you were just saying about getting the right people to the table to, Jamila, what you were saying about how um, there are large swaths of uh, white Medicaid beneficiaries who are disadvantaged by what's happening now. Um, let me be a little bit provocative. You know, in the history of social policy, especially within the anti-poverty space, I mean, you see white faces um, when, um, when the political powers that be are looking at program expansion and they become black when it becomes politically expedient um, for retrenchment, right? Um, rather than looking at kind of a cross, cross racial constituency um, of organizing advocacy, um, would it just be more effective to make clear how people within the in-group, right? I mean, we didn't design these systems to exclude you guys. We did it for everyone else. So kind of centering the people who are most like um, the identity of the people in power. This is so good. So well, one of the things that I, um, I mean, of course, I'm not going to subscribe to that. But, but it's, a, it's an <laughs> I important. I about that, though, because I think other people do. Uh, oh, yeah, I was going to say, it's an important practical question. Because when I was organizing or interviewing some of these organizations, the, and I would say, well, what role do actual Medicaid beneficiaries play in your process? A lot of them would say, well, oh, none, actually. But the ones who said there's a role would say, well, stories, right? We use beneficiaries so that we can bring their stories to the legislators. And we teach them how to tell their story. And we coach them how to do it. We train them. And then they go. And the stories are impactful. And one of the things I, I, I always said was, well, which beneficiaries do you choose? <laughs> and based on what criteria? Because ostensibly, some stories are more sympathetic. Some are more compelling. Some people are more sympathetic, more compelling. And they said, yeah, of course. We try. We very carefully pick the people. And then I said, oh, OK. You know, you got to lead them, lead the horse to the water. Um, what? Does race matter? Like, if you have two equally sympathetic women who are Medicaid beneficiaries, women are more sympathetic, and one is a black woman and one is a white woman, and here we are in whatever, fill in the blank, Missouri, like, who are you going to bring to the Capitol with you? And, you know, I was impressed by their frankness. People just said, absolutely, I mean, it's terrible, but you bring the white woman. 
right? And so the question, right, which is, uh, do we censor the in-group? Is that a, str a strategic way to, I, I, that like just repulses me, <laughs> but it's absolutely what's happening and what people who are, there's a reason I'm not a politician and, and you know, the people who are more politically savvy are doing this. My, the reason it repulses me is not just because, you know, for the obvious reasons, um, but the reason it repulses me is because like that's not a long-term term, right. term sustainable yeah. strategy. That deepens the divisions, builds further upon them, and then the decision, the divisions become continued. So somehow we're trying to get to equity by capitalizing on inequity, right? Mm -hmm. And I just don't think that holds water in the end. But again, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a pragmatist, so what do I know? I'm sure there's somebody out there. <laughs> well, that's why you're not going to work on my campaign, and that's fine. I want no part of it. So I think we have time for one more question. Hi, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. Um, I just had a question around sort of this idea of community engagement we've been talking about and how do we, you know, when we're trying to bring folks to the table, be very intentional to where beyond tokenism, we're also placing value in their expertise and avoiding essentially extraction from these communities. Yeah, this is a hard one. <laughs> tokenism is a phenomenon I'm very familiar with. Um, and I mean, and I say that jokingly, but I also say it in a way that's true, right? Where there are plenty of spaces where it's like you're invited into the space because it becomes clear like, oh my gosh, we did this whole thing and we don't have any, you know, fill in the blank. We don't have any women. We don't have any people of color. Oh, you check both boxes. Come on in. And then you get the distinct feeling that you're not really a voice at the table, right? You're sitting there. You're a box check, but you're not a voice. The question is, how do we have engagement that's substantive? That's not like we really need to have some Medicaid beneficiaries in the room or else we all feel really guilty and we're not being good liberals. And so bring them in the room. But then they say something, you're like, ah, eh, I don't know. You don't, you don't necessarily really know what you're saying. You don't understand the nuances of policy. You're not using the right language, the right terms. You're not articulating it in just the way that all the people in, in my circle know how to articulate it. And uh, that's a challenge anytime. I mean, you know, even if you think about community health centers and the boards of community health centers having to have this repre representation from actual people in the community. Um, and there's real variation across centers, whether those people have a voices and they're influencing what happens with the centers, or whether they're just there because they have to be there um, by virtue of these criteria that were set up. And so, you know, I think part of, I don't know how to, you know, a lot of this depends on how people are implementing engagement initiatives in real life. Um, on why they're doing it and on what sort of what sorts of institutional um, structures they form to ensure that the that the the people that you bring into the table actually are there in a meaningful way and so I don't know if yeah, yeah. no that's exactly right you know it's a playing field even for everybody so I mean I'll give a really good example of how this um, played out in a, in Rhode Island where we work with advocates um, and they're sort of um, working on a policy issue to influence that impacts both people who are on Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and there is this implementation council that has been set up. And um, you know, the goal was to make sure that the implementation council was run, co-chaired by consumers who are going to be in this new program. And so we said, well, they need to be trained. They need to know that they're going into the meeting so they can be confident so that when they're around the table with providers and state officials or other, um, other you know, paid advocates who are doing this um, for a living, that they're also on the same ground. And so that's what we did. We provided training to our advocates so that they can go out and then train these consumers so that they can sit on the table. And what they do now is they provide ongoing training. So before every implementation council meeting, they will meet separately with the co-chairs um, and talk about agenda, talk about you know, how to be engaged in this conversation um, and build their policy capacity to understand the different terminology and the jargon that goes into health policy. So I think it's really important to make sure that, like you said, the structures are set up in a way so that the playing field is even and that um, you know, there's ongoing training for advocates and consumers who may not be playing this every day you know, living in this everyday language. And I, I might even <laughs> want training for the other folks in the room who may or may not know how to yes. interact with people who are not in their narrow little exactly. circle. Exactly. So the burden of having to learn how to navigate new spaces doesn't overwhelmingly fall on the people who already probably have exactly. more burden. So exactly. That's just a one, one thing yeah. that we have 
learned in Richmond is there were uh, there was a, a group of people that were always present in front of city council who uh, purported to represent the community, <laughs> yeah. and over time they just were really good on their feet and liked to express themselves and we created this ambassador program in a way to expand the community voice uh, and and ask people to move out of their comfort zone give them some training but but also say we need you to tell us what your experience is because we know that Ms. Jones or Mr. Jones who usually stands up in every council meeting may or may not know you and so here's how we would like you to feel that you have access to government as well. And so we've trained 16 people. We want to train at least 20 every year so that we, in essence, they become the face, the ears, the, the, the messengers, and also those to relay it back to us in case they don't feel comfortable sitting at one of our tables. And this is work on all of our ends, both sides, yeah. I find myself thinking about um, how difficult it is to do this kind of work in a society which is trying oftentimes to be race blind and even more frequently to be class blind um, and, and to pretend that those things don't exist. And so then you have, you know, frequently community groups where the leaders of the group are the highest income people in the community. Um, state or citywide groups where the leaders of that group are the highest income people in the city or state um, and kind of on and on it goes mm -hmm. and I, I find myself particularly thinking of uh, you know in Philadelphia there's the Kensington workers um, or the, the Kensington welfare rights union which is a group of really poor people who work together um, to try to um, make their lives better in all sorts of interesting ways one thing they don't really do is give each other money because they don't have it to give but they give each other respect and mutual assistance in ways that are really impressive. And they've had to think very carefully about what types of charity and assistance to take um, and from whom, because when will they be surrendering um, aspects of control, right? And when we particularly think about greater and greater levels of economic inequality that are facing us, it's really going to be difficult to preserve democracy if we don't um, confront the challenge of giving people who are at lower levels of socioeconomic class a voice. It, the, the Roman Republic managed to do it for a couple hundred years mm -hmm. by having specific government offices which were available only um, to people from the middle classes. Obviously they ignored the two-thirds who were <laughs> slaves, um, but they, they had certain offices that, were, that they thought, we, we know that the upper class will dominate the Senate, et cetera, so they had tribunes. We have nothing like that and have never even remotely considered it. I don't know that we could, but we have to figure out some way to institutionalize across many cities um, the kind of work that's happening in, in Richmond. All right, and that's the difference between voice and power, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I guess your question made me think of that, uh, the Parkland, um, the students, the movement they had, the event they had. Where I think the students knew who the most palatable, powerful, powerful, influential voice essentially were, the white men, but they seemed to intentionally make sure to include other people. I think ultimately, you know, we know who has the power in our society, whites and men usually, and ultimately we're gonna need some benevolent members of those people to sort of give some power up and share some power and create institutions to, you know, share power and make, make them more inclusive. I think that's what we're really talking about here is like all these programs are gonna change by people who are having power making them change. Or by us resting, by somebody <laughs> resting power from those people, whether or not they benevolently give it up. Okay. But that's less, I, I get yes. it. Yeah. <laughs> that, we the same thing. Yeah, yes. that was it. <laughs> and I think, I think that also points to, I mean, looking at um, maybe we would all aspire to live in a place where our government, the, our society affirms like the shared and equal dignity and humanity of everybody else around us, but understanding that's not how we work, um, realizing that there is a selfish in, selfish self-interest, right, and recognizing that racialized systems um, uh, impact and disadvantage people of all races. I mean, this is Michelle Alexander's critique from, you know, uh, the new Jim Crow, right? I mean, to maintain a veneer of race neutrality, there's going to be collateral damage, you know, if people of different races. So uh, I think people who 
potentially Medicaid beneficiaries who are white, rather than kind of being centered in the conversation, use that platform, right, to bring attention and visibility to the ways that creating uh, a system to marginalize people of color, and particularly black Americans, uh, works against the interest of, of all of us. I'd really like to give you the last word in this conversation about your book. <laughs> way too many words already. But. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely grateful to all of you for, my gosh, you have stuck it out <laughs> <laughs> over the long haul. There's a part of me that wonders, like, who just comes to something for like two hours to yeah. listen to other people? See, I do these things because I'm the one talking. <laughs> so no, thank you all. You know, what I'm thinking about as we end here is actually, so I had a speaker in my public policy class. We were doing public policy and local governance. And I invited a speaker who's a local county legislator. Um, her name is Leslie McBean Claiborne, first African-American, and she's an African-American woman, but first African-American person of color at all to ever be a member of the Tompkins County Legislature. I don't know if you guys know much about upstate New York, but it's quite white. Um, and she told my student, a lot of the students wanted to know, like, well, tell us your story, you know? And she told them about how she was low income, she was a Medicaid beneficiary, she, she was a, a, you know, a Section 8, on Section 8 vouchers, she was working low-wage jobs, uh, trying to take care of her family, just having a really hard time, but always wanted to be involved in her community, engaged in the community, going to community events. And something happened with one of the sitting um, county legislators, and they had to, oh, they moved to a different county, which, surprise, if you, if you don't live in the county, you can't be on the legislature. So they really needed somebody quick who, who could fill in. And she, and they were like, you're always at the meetings. You're, you know about the community, you care about the community. Why not you? And she said she walked into a room one day, and they said, we're going to start a, a, a political group for you. We're going to try to get you in this spot. And it worked out. She's a county legislator. But she's still low income. County legislators at this time in Tompkins County get like, I don't know, a couple thousand dollars a year, not enough to live on, because everyone else on the legislature is essentially an old white man or woman who's independently wealthy, retired, not doing this for the money. And she's still raising small children, still working full time, and the rest of them aren't. And she proceeded to take my students through this story of saying, like, I, you know, I was engaged. I, I was in a, I, be, I got a position where I had pow, a voice, where I had voice, right? I was at the meetings, right? But I didn't have power because I was very differentially positioned relative to everyone else. So I was at the meetings and I spoke my piece. It didn't matter. I couldn't spend as much time on it. I couldn't engage with my constituents as much. And it was just, the students were really struck by the challenges of securing real power from the margins. And even someone who was standing in front of them who seemed compelling, who seemed admirable, and who was literally in a position where she had a voice, um, still had a tremendously difficult time being heard and making a difference. And that kind of, I think, taps into a lot of the underlying currents of this conversation. How do, what does it mean for us to, to think about people having power, being empowered, who are not already in that position, right? And who don't look like and have the advantages of the people who are generally in those positions. And how does public policy affect the likelihood of that kind of power being enacted? And how do political institutions, how do parties, all of these different challenges are about thinking about how to empower people who otherwise do not have power and who are otherwise relegated to the sort of political margins. And we obviously did not encounter any answers, um, but I think that we had a lot of ideas that matter and that stench. It's the development, the continued generation development of these ideas and, and hopefully the kind of enactment of some of these ideas that gets us closer to a place where I don't feel like it's all pie in the sky, which I often do, but that it's, it's a real possibility for us to live in a country that is an actual equal democracy. That's a great place to end things. And the good news is you'll have a chance to find out who comes to these things and stays for two hours at our reception. Please join me in thanking our panel and Jamila.